Foundation 45 is a 501c3 nonprofit that funds counseling services for mental health, addiction, and suicide survivors. In addition to providing services, it works to break the stigma surrounding these topics. Foundation 45 recognizes that musicians, artists, and creative types are often at a higher risk for issues with mental health and addiction. The organization's goal is to serve the Dallas-Fort Worth creative community by providing free, top-tier mental health and recovery services. You can learn more about Foundation 45 at foundation45.org. Foundation 45. Live fast, die old. I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. So who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? Who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? For us, yeah. This week on the Dallas Famous Podcast, we have Claire Daigle. Claire is the Director of Education at the Dallas Comedy Club. After her first love and ambition of being a dancer was derailed by injury, Claire discovered she had an affinity for being behind the scenes. COVID motivated Claire to take a stab at stand-up, and she took a class at the Dallas Comedy Club, which led to her taking a huge role at the theater. Her ultimate goal is to make Dallas the southern destination for stand-up comedy training. Her love for the scene is palpable, and I was very happy to have her on and introduce much of the audience to the comedy scene in Dallas. So here it is, Claire Daigle. We're here at the Deep Elm Community Center. We've got Claire Daigle. Your official title is... So my official title is Director of Education at Dallas Comedy Club. Right. And so we're going to get to know you, but we're also going to kind of get our first Dallas famous first look at like the Dallas comedy scene as it were, DFW scene. That's right. So let's start with you. Um, you are from? Uh, so I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, okay. So nearby. Uh, yeah, they just the quick eight hour drive. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, born and raised in New Orleans. My whole family is still there. I uh, moved to Dallas. I did not expect I was going to be here for very long. I got a scholarship to go to SMU. Mm. Uh, it was a little shocking because I was definitely like the poor scholarship kid. <laughs> and so going from New Orleans, where it's a very um, strong and specific culture, to the then living in the middle of Highland Park, going to SMU, uh. it was total culture shock for me. Um, I honestly hated Dallas the first five years I was here because I was just at SMU and I, I didn't right. really know that there was anything to the town beyond that. And then eventually I started, you know, reaching out beyond that. Um, I started life as a dance kid. Mm. I that's I got a dance scholarship to SMU and was really a little too hardcore about it. And uh, I got super injured, super burnt out, swore off the arts forever. I was like, I'm never, I was like, I'm, I'm done. I'm never gonna do this again. I got, I like to say I got whiplashed. If you've seen the movie Whiplash, like huh. I relate too much to that movie, <laughs> um, unfortunately. And so, um, Stayed in Dallas, though, because there's no hurricanes here. Uh, and believe it or not, the roads are way better here than in New Orleans. I and do, but that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> no hurricanes, better health care, um, better roads. But, just... you, but you, so you, you're like, so you're here, you finished school. Yeah. You just didn't dance towards the end. No, okay. I, I didn't dance. I majored in history just because that's what I could finish on time. Mm -hmm. I was determined to, to graduate right. and I'm glad I did. But, it you know, I, I am using my education. I think it was good for me to get. But I, you know, I didn't get the dance degree and move off to New York like right. I expected. Right, so right. I was here. Um, I met a guy. And so that's what kept me here. But I had sworn off the arts basically I was right. like I did this and I got burned and I'm not doing it again and so my fiance is in a band and 
I was starting to get jealous a little bit. Like you, I, where you stayed here for your current fiance? Yeah, I mean, I have friends here and stuff too. But like, I mean, that's the boyfriend you're. Yeah, too. yeah. Okay, so we can um, say his name. It's Austin. Oh yeah, it's Austin. Um, yeah, from the so, band Chancy. Um, I met Austin in 2018, and that was kind of like final incentive of like, okay, well, I I can stay here. Like this this works for me. But I would go to his shows and it was almost like a little gateway back into things for me. Um, Going to his shows was kind of just the gateway drug, I guess. Because I was fun shows. (laughs) They're they're really fun. They're really nice guys, too. And I just started to realize I was trying to, like, live vicariously through him. Um, Their band was still kind of just starting out when I came around. And I like to think that I helped them a lot with some things. They didn't have a manager at first and we'd have meetings and I'd be like, okay, we need to talk about like, what are your artistic goals? Like, we're going to sit down, we're going to get a whiteboard, really get some shit together for you guys. And uh, I just, I was starting to realize that I missed it. I missed being in the arts. And at the same time, I wasn't in the band like I didn't want to be in the band and it was you know that's that's his thing and um I didn't I didn't want to like commandeer that and and get involved in it so yeah but I mean let me just stop you for a second so I mean obviously dancing you know there's a whole strategy that you're like Mm -hmm. like different ways you're looking at it and living your life but that's the arts but you now you're talking about you were helping them with manager stuff and yeah. like you know that sounds like the other side of the coin with the arts yes. really behind the scenes so i'm i'm really lucky when i was in high school the executive director of new orleans ballet association would let me shadow her for the day sometimes huh. and at the time i was like well this is just like a really cool fun thing it's really nice of her um and then looking back i'm like dang, she was grooming me for this a little bit. Uh, And then when I was in college, I was injured so much that I spent a lot of time working backstage. And I absolutely resented it at the time. (laughs) Um, And now I just, it's like everything that I have done before and absolutely resented, now I'm doing all of it and I absolutely love it. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) So, um, yeah. You resented because you had that, that competitive spirit of being the performer, like the star. Yeah, kind a of little thing. bit. Yeah. Um, it was just, it's been an interesting kind of journey and transition because I, I do really like performing, but I've realized in time that I have a kind of knack for being in the management side of it that mm-hmm. not everyone has. Right. And so like, I'm a proficient performer, like I'm pretty funny. Um, I started performing stand up actually right after COVID because I was, I really missed performing we were all stuck inside for so long. And then when we could go out again, I was like, I need a hobby. I need new friends. <laughs> all my friends just coincidentally had moved away right before COVID. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try stand up. I'd always kind of wanted to do it. So just so. out of nowhere, that was just a COVID like kind of like. Yeah, that was kind of the the final thing. I don't know if it was a like, well, life is short. We could all die of a pandemic kind of thing. <laughs> but it was just it was good timing. So. I was actually in Dallas Comedy Club's first ever stand-up class. Oh. Uh, that's how I got, uh, I guess, started there. Um, and then I, I just did it for fun, really. I was like, this is just a fun thing. I took the class because I wanted to make friends, and mm-hmm. I figured that was a fast way to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was. I'm still friends with a lot of my classmates. But it was just a nice little way to get back into performing. And I remember at my first show just feeling like okay I really do love this it's Mm kind of dumb that I swore off performing and (laughs) the other thing is stand-up comedy hurts a whole lot less than being a professional dancer Um, physically I'm not covered in bruises I don't have pulled muscles uh, which is great for me (laughs) (laughs) so well but I mean like uh, I I get it like we're all watching Netflix and you see Mm -hmm. like what what drew you to stand-up specifically so specifically um, I mean, I've watched it over the years and, and enjoyed it, but the specific moment. So I've been sober for seven years and I was watching 
a John Mulaney special. It's the one where he talks about being at a party and someone has a bottle and they say, is this liquor or is this perfume? And he drinks the whole thing and then says, it's perfume. (laughs) And I I just thought to myself, I have stories like that. Like I've got (laughs) way crazier stories than that. If he can do this and sell out Radio City and make all this money, like I could probably be okay at it. <laughs> so that was that was my final kind of impetus okay. to start performing and uh but you know I performed and very quickly made my way back to the management side where mm. I always swore I would never be but I, I you know just the pattern of my life is whether it's an injury whether it's someone just kind of trying to be a mentor to me I always find myself back on the management side of it mm. and I've come to the point now where I, I realize it's because I'm good at it yeah and I really like it yeah well and people need people like you the artists need there's more people trying to be artists and a lot of them don't have this realization that maybe their skill sets better serve somewhere else so that's yes I mean again not yes. that you couldn't do stand-up but I mean it's probably more fulfilling to not just perform but to have these other ways to help you know the art yeah grow. and I am in a unique oper- or a unique position where I'm able to create opportunities for artists mm-hmm. and this town has so many talented people in it so to to be on the side where I can make sure things are happening and that people have opportunities to perform and grow here that's that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Now give us if you can a little bit of history because I really like there was another Dallas Comedy Store or something yes. that like ended and then this is something different. Yes. So um, and we owe a lot to them. Dallas Comedy House was in Deep Ellum for, I believe, 11 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they kind of got a scene started down here in this neighborhood and, and really created something that was thriving. And then uh, the neighborhood changes frequently Mm -hmm. um we see these cycles over the years and uh the neighborhood was changing things were getting bought up it was harder to stay in business down here in general um they got a beautiful new facility which is where dallas comedy club currently is and made it a really special place and then COVID happened Mm -hmm. so that was kind of uh the nail in the coffin for dch and it was really a sad time for the Dallas comedy community because not only, you know, people couldn't go out and do what they love to do, but Mm -hmm. then DCH had closed and a lot of people were just kind of lost a little bit. So Dallas comedy club is now it's a different business. Um, The owners, Rosie and Ian Carruth were regular performers and, real regulars at dch oh, okay so they're kind of are carrying on the legacy in a way. oh yeah in a way um they were just you know they really missed it they were in a position to start a club and had kind of been tossing around the idea before covid and then the landlords at dcc really loved that there was a comedy club there before they really wanted another club as a tenant so it just kind of worked out mm-hmm. and dcc was able to kind of inherit this beautiful space that was already built out for comedy and that set us up for success Mm -hmm. in so many ways and um you know just like the neighborhood changes it's it's a new business but it's nice to still have comedy in deep ellum and and in dallas and um we do I don't know if you've seen it, but we have a pretty gorgeous building. So yeah. it's it's cool. We can be kind of just one of the hubs for comedy yeah. in the city. So like, uh, like let's talk about, um, so you have headliners come through, mm-hmm. you have local, you have, do you have improv still? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So like, d- explain to me like what like a weekly like uh, showcase looks like, what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, so the week. I'll just take you through the week. Yeah. So when we're closed Monday, Tuesday, those are kind of our sacred days where we're still working, but you got to have a, a day to rest yeah uh and then wednesday is our open mic and improv jam so those are both free to attend uh is it the same thing or they're to both so happen? it's we have two theaters okay. in our building okay. so one theater has the open mic which is pretty impressive sometimes it's it's a lot of working comics who come in uh there's kind of limited spots for people who just show up and and sign up and we open to the public at six. People start lining up outside the building at five just oh, to get wow. on our open mic. Okay. 
And then in the other theater, we have our improv jam. So that is a really special place where anyone who attends can get up on stage and try improv. Mm -hmm. And it's led by instructors from the training center. And it's a really just welcoming kind of nurturing way to try comedy for the first time if you're terrified of getting on stage or you've never done anything because mm -hmm. you're just getting on stage and playing make-believe with a bunch of grown-ups there's plenty of people there who are gonna like coach you through it and help make you look good too so yeah. a lot of people come to the jam for the first time and that's when they're kind of bit by the comedy bug yeah oh god i miss i used to do improv in mm -hmm. way years ago and i i do miss it but i also feel like i've gotten so old that like my brain is like too censoring so i probably need a class or two to to like brush yeah it up i think you could get back in you just need to come to a jam yeah come to yeah. a jam yeah. knock yeah. off the cobwebs <laughs> but so that's our wednesdays are pretty popular because uh -huh. it's it's free to attend okay um, Thursday night is more of a local night. We have improv club teams. So these are our in-house teams for oh, improv. Okay. Yeah, they perform every Thursday at 8. We when you currently, say teams, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. When you say teams, it's not competition. It's just different teams. No, just, okay. just different teams, just different groups. Good. So I, I hated that improv competition. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. In comedy sports or whatever it was Yeah, called. we so don't have know. competitions. I think there is a comedy sports troupe in the area, but... Oh, I, I apologize. I oh, know <laughs> no, it's not... Not, it's not for everybody yeah, um yeah. but so these are just kind of our our in-house groups mm -hmm. most of the participants i'd say 95 percent of our um team members are former students or current students mm -hmm. even uh so they're every thursday and then we'll have kind of a rotating list of local shows we've got queer factor which is uh mostly lgbtq community uh, we've got People Presenting Things, which is an improvised slideshow presentation. It's super fun. Huh. There's Brown Out, which is um, Sri Raj, who's a local comedian, runs that show. Um, I'm trying, I feel like I'm forgetting another Thursday night, but occasionally we'll have people like more kind of up and comer touring comics come through on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And then Friday and Saturday are the big nights for the club. So that's when we have our touring headliners who are bigger names who will come through and do four shows over the weekend. We also have one of the area's only professional improv teams. So, oh, okay. yeah, our primetime improv team, they do um, it's short form improv. You probably know what that is, but a lot of people don't. Mm. It's more of like the whose line is it anyway style. Sure where it's short games and you know if you hate what's going on on stage well good news it's over in under two minutes so it's <laughs> right. it's a really fun really interactive show and um then we'll kind of fill in the late night spots and stuff with with local comics okay so it's it's really fun no Pri long form improv uh those are usually a little earlier in the night. Okay, we, um, do have that. we do have that. It's okay. we have a lot of really good indie troops mm -hmm. in town who aren't necessarily not not really affiliated with a club, but they do perform. We're kind of a home base for a lot of them. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Is so, there other improv theaters in the area? Yeah. So there's actually uh, a ton of comedy venues in DFW. Okay. That's one of the things that's really special about this city. So I'd say the main places to catch improv in Dallas would be, uh, well, Dallas Comedy Club, but, you know, I'm kind of biased there. <laughs> right. um, Beyond yours. There's Stomping Ground, which is down in the design district. They're mm -hmm. also a nonprofit. They have a lot of really cool programming um, that we can't necessarily do. So they have like a improv for anxiety, improv for caregivers, a lot of different classes wow. that are really cool. Wow. Okay. That's yeah. Cool. So that that's another great place to catch improv shows. Uh, Comedy Arena up in McKinney. Okay, wait. Mm -hmm. I know that's not your thing, but are you saying that you you go to watch it because you have anxiety or you take the class? Oh, so it's a. I think it's a. I'm not sure if it's a class or a workshop, okay. but it's it's like an improv class for people who have anxiety. Okay. Okay. I think they usually have um, like a teacher and a therapist there. Oh, wow. Which is super cool. Like they're a nonprofit, so they can get grant funding for stuff like sure. that. Which, I've never heard of that. That's yeah, amazing. it's it's pretty cool, and it's a good asset to the community. And like we're a private business, so we can't do that. Right, so right. It's um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, but so other places to catch improv, a uh, comedy arena up in McKinney has some. You know, if you're up north, mm. and then four day weekend 
is one of the like they've been around for a long time yeah Yeah, they have a theater in dallas but i think their main locations in fort worth okay you know we we skipped ahead but like let's come back to your theater like let's talk about the classes that you guys offer. yeah so that's that's my official job um i wear a lot of different hats but my official job is director of education yes so um, we offer lots of different types of classes. So there's long form improv, which is like if you think Curb Your Enthusiasm, they make everything up on the spot. That's it's like a one act improvised play, basically. There's short form improv. It's not mm-hmm. called Harold. It's different than Harold. So Harold is one of the forms we teach in kind of our upper level classes. Um, so it is kind of a core focus of our curriculum once you get to like the higher levels Mm -hmm. um so but we really focus our classes on in levels one through three level one is just try it out come play with us Mm -hmm. come have a good time learn what improv is about develop a love for it i want to say out loud too that like i highly recommend you don't need to want to be an actor comedian like go take an improv class you will feel so much better about your whole life it's so fun you do meet people i just want to interject that i highly recommend it and yeah you continue thank you no yeah. it's it's great to hear someone besides me say it yeah no it is the best it's, you don't have to have the goal to be a performer ever it is still worth it yeah it we like to just think it makes you a better person yeah. in general mm-hmm. um look at me yeah, yeah you know <laughs> mr improv expert over uh, here yeah. expert yeah but it's it's good for exercising active listening and just being a better listener which mm-hmm. in turn can make you a better person yeah i am someone i've got super bad adhd i struggle with listening sometimes because i just want to jump in and and improv has helped me a lot mm-hmm. to just kind of be in the moment and not have expectations and then react uh genuinely to what my scene partner or my conversation partner gives me. Right. So it's, there's, I think everyone should take an improv class. Right. Absolutely. But level one long form is the best place to start. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the basics, the peas and carrots and um, just getting into it. And then our level two and three kind of focus more on like, here's the rules and the tools. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got in the door you got bit by the bug. You like this. Now we're going to give you some stuff in your toolbox so you can be a really good performer. Hmm. And then uh, the upper levels of our program are, are more honed in on making like everyone making it possible so everyone can be the best performer they can. And whatever that means for individual people, it just becomes a little more individualized at that point. Of course, you're still in a class with, you know, 10 other people because improv is the team sport of comedy. Oh, yeah. But it it's a little more focused on your individual skills and and lifting you up where you're a little weaker. And and uh, by the end of it, since we do have a professional improv troupe, our goal is basically to have the opportunities never stop coming. So, you know, you take level one long form, you really love it. Well, maybe you've taken a couple classes, then you get on to our club team that performs on Thursdays. And so you're getting to perform and you're getting the reps and the practice while you're still training. Then you finish, we have five levels to our program. You finish our five levels, you do some more conservatory level, upper upper level training. And then eventually we want you to be able to perform professionally on our stage. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. And, you know, not everyone has to become a professional performer. That's the fun of improv is not really the end game ever. It's the process. But in general, we have a theater. We have a club. We need good programming. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to make it ourselves and really, um, you know, mold the scene and and create kind of a Dallas style of improv in the process, gotcha. hopefully. That's so so let me ask you this, like if somebody starts on level one and they, they go straight through the classes, like how long does that take to finish the whole training? So you could probably finish it in a year. 
Oh, um, oh, I didn't realize. Okay. Sometimes we do space out the classes a little bit, though, because there is a lot of benefit to just getting reps in, getting that practice. Right. But it's not like you got to do five years of schooling. No. Yeah. I can't. No. I want that to be heard from people. It's like, yeah, that, no, that no, used no. to scare me away in California. Like, there's like the groundlings. Like, you're like, you can audition right now and you can make it and you can get through the whole program and then you will wait at least a year. That was in the 90s, a year before you'll get on stage. I don't know what it is now. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Groundlings is intense. I would love to to try it like I mean I don't live in LA so that would make it really challenging but um we there is a lot of benefit to like giving yourself time as an artist to grow and that's true in everything not just improv but um in terms of the classes if you really are like on a fast track you could probably get through five levels in about a year maybe a year and a half but beyond that, you do need to st- uh, you know, keep working Yeah. and be on teams, be on club teams, be on indie teams, find a good coach. Yeah. Um, I mean, also, what I learned, too, is like the, the classes are great and they're fun. And then when you get on stage, it's like it is a whole different thing. Yeah. Your brain doesn't work the same. Like the class <laughs> sort of like get you ready for that. And then you, you're never ready for it. In the yeah. First, it seems like sometimes you just like blank out and forget everything you've learned but uh it's cumulative though you can really there's a lot of times now where you know I know what I'm looking at now that I have this like more educated view of comedy but you can really tell when you watch improv you know you can always tell that was good that was bad any audience can discern whether something's good or bad Mm -hmm. but once you have more of an improv education you can start picking out like why something was good like oh well like they caught on to the game in that scene and were able to to work around that and so it was funny or like well you know they kind of lost it and you're able to to have a more technical view of it Mm -hmm. and then through that technique just becoming ingrained then over time you become a better player but it it is totally different from being in a classroom to being on stage yeah we were talking on the phone about uh the way that you see the future of dallas uh as a as really a destination for comedy training so Mm -hmm. like i want to hear more about that yeah so i um as we talked about earlier i really have that more like management business mindset um within the arts and you know i worked in the scene very briefly it it, even to say I worked as a comic is is very much an overstatement but I got into this scene and quickly realized that this is a special place to be for comedy Mm. Um, my best friend lives in Chicago for example and they're more famous in the comedy scene Uh, a lot of people think you know oh I've got to move to New York LA Chicago Mm -hmm. if I want to be a comic at the end of the day dfw has at least 10 venues that are strictly for comedy Hmm. that's not even counting like the bar shows the shows that take place in coffee shops um just the shows that are in unique locations that's not counting for podcasts that's not counting for improv shows in people's driveways uh there is a ton of comedy in dallas it's really a special town and we have a lot of resources at our disposal. So the smart thing to do is use it and and really make something out of this place. A lot of people think that Austin is the hub for the arts in Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff. And is it the historic hub for the arts in Texas? I'd say, yeah, probably. But uh, it's very different now. Um And, you know, I'm sure other people can speak to the city in general better than I can. But in terms of comedy, Joe Rogan moved in Mm -hmm. and, you know, very successful guy, um, but not everyone's cup of tea in terms of comedy. He's a very specific type. Oh, yeah. And it isn't necessarily commercially appealing. Like he's he's one guy who has commercial success, but the style that's coming up in Austin as the most prevalent right now does not get booked on late night. Right. Um, it's, it's a very different style than what you see on Netflix, than what you see actually out there public facing. Right. 
my, my, so I lived in Austin briefly and my experience was the improv scene. I don't even yeah. know about any of the stand up scene personally. I mean, the improv scene was amazing. I don't know that how much it was hitting the radar anywhere else, but yeah. it was cool. Just they had so many different, like different variations of the same kind of shows. There but. is, there is a lot of good improv in Austin. I will say we've had some people move to Dallas from Austin and they trained there first and they're so good. Yeah. I'm um, so grateful to have them too, because yeah, totally. it's fun. We get to learn from them a little bit, but there's so many people coming to Dallas there's so much money in Dallas as well because, you you know, at the end of the day, we have to be able to fund the arts. Um, and there's just a lot of talent and a lot of hunger here. Not little hunger for being oh, in the yeah. arts. Yeah, and a hunger for seeing good comedy, yes. I'm guessing. And so people here feel like they have to work harder because it's not a destination city for mm -hmm, comedy. Mm -hmm. In terms of stand-up, Dallas stand-ups are some of the tightest writers, at least in Texas. Uh, because there's so many opportunities here, there's so many places to get booked, there's so much competition, you have to be pretty good. Hmm. Um, and not everyone's gonna be great, but we do have a lot of people coming out of this town who are extremely strong writers. Mm -hmm. And um, to be a successful stand-up, that's that's the core of it if you can't sure. write you're not gonna make it at the end of the day like you have to be talented too with any art there's that balance between the innate talent and the learned technique and you gotta have both and i think that in terms of the learned technique dallas is a really great place for that because we have a lot of strong writers mm -hmm. uh, as far as the improv community goes we have just a lot of people and there, you know, it's, it's a little different than stand up. Stand up is just very commercially appealing right now. You can watch it on every streaming service. That's a lot of people's first foot in the door for comedy. And in Dallas, we have like, it's good. We have good stand up here. I meant to ask you too. Now at the school, do you have stand up classes? We do. Okay, we I do have stand up that. classes. Yeah. So, um, you know, like I said, stand up is a lot of people's first foot into comedy because they see it on TV. They think, oh, that looks fun. I could try it or that looks fun. I want to go see a show. So we have um, currently two levels of stand up class. We're working on a third, but it's basically the ways to start stand up are either you go to a bunch of open mics and fall flat on your face mm -hmm. a million and a half times. And out of that million times, one time is good. And that's what you learn from. Taking a class just gives you more of a, a tool belt when you're starting. It teaches you how to write. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because it's like it wouldn't have occurred to me like years ago. And it's like that's that, that that's how you don't completely fall on your mm -hmm. face because it's same with, with improv. It's like when you learn the tools, then you forget what you're doing. And you can fall back on the tools. Yeah. You know? And so it, it teaches you how to write. It also teaches you a lot of the etiquette. Yeah. There's so much unspoken etiquette in the arts and stand up is no exception. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the secrets that you learn in a class. And you have a teacher who's a working comic who is a mentor for you. Uh, we have three teachers right now, Megan King, uh, Tyson Pfeiffer and Emily Griefer and they're all really great. They're all working in the scene. Um, you know, Megan is out of town almost every weekend because mm -hmm. she's on the road working. So all of our teachers are there to give you practical advice too. And it's based on real world experience. That's good. So it's just, it's one of the values of taking a class really is you have someone who's established who is there to help you and they're rooting for you and they're in your corner. The whole club is in your corner. <laughs> so it's, it's an, it's a, I think less scary yes. way to start. It's, it totally, it's more approachable. Yes. And unrealistic to the first time you go into the fire, but I guess it's probably easier to go in the fire when you've had that experience. First. Yeah. It's the fire is less hot <laughs> when you, when you know what to expect. Yeah. And then, um, so our second level is focused more on, more complicated joke structures uh -huh. and and a little more on the performance side as well. And How much time do you guys spend on these classes about like PC comedy? So is that something that comes up about? Wait, like, say that again. Like PC, like 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 how to handle like what should you not be joking? Like is that something oh, that's a conversation? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is a conversation. Um, you know, obviously we have 
the right to say whatever we want, but you shouldn't always. Yeah, well, you have the uh, right to say it, and then you also other people have the right to respond to, to say that. stuff back to yeah. you. So you know, we train people to work on the cleaner side because when you're getting established in comedy, you just need people to like you. Mm-hmm. Um, you you can't start comedy being super edgy. You have to start with strong writing Mm -hmm. and if you can write clean then later you can go and write dirty that's Mm -hmm. actually um so backdoor is one of the long-standing clubs in dfw it started by linda stogner and jan norton and uh, jan has since passed away but i remember having just some really good conversations with her um she had gotten really sick by the time I started comedy, but you have to actually call on the phone to sign up at Backdoor. And <laughs> I loved it because I would end up chatting with Jan for 25 minutes. And, you know, she was a stickler for that of you have to work clean because it really is. That is so much harder than getting out there and writing just super dirty material. Mm-hmm. I don't even mean dirty. Like, it's like we're living in a different world where like, like sex jokes aren't even as offensive as lots of other content oh yeah yeah um but i mean at the end of the day you just you want to get people on your side sure and especially like this is a big city you have very diverse opinions in your crowd absolutely so why make a political joke that might alienate half your audience especially as a new comic right once you've been in the game for 10 years and people kind of know who you are then you can try that out because you already have an established fan base who are gonna you know some you might lose some people but you have your people and you can start to push a little bit but Mm. You know, starting out in comedy, the best thing you can do is to just not be controversial. Um, So many people, they start and they're like, oh, I just want to be the next George Carlin. And I'm like, (laughs) okay, so George Carlin started out on radio and doing birthday parties. Right. Like he did not start where he ended up. No, you have to start out kind of squeaky. Yeah. And then earn it. You have to earn it. Yeah. Yeah. So... I mean, this has been great. What I, I mean, I know what you want the future to look like. You want this to be the yeah. destination. Like, what else yes. do you want? Like, what else is your goals with this? Yeah. So I'm I am in a very privileged position because I work for a club that also has a training center. As far as I know, we're the only club in Dallas that has two theaters with touring headliners in stand up, a professional improv team and a full training center. Hmm. So we have the infrastructure to really uh, serve the people of Dallas. And my goal would be that eventually Dallas is the comedy hub for the Southern United States. You know, we have New York, LA, Chicago, but none of those are in the South. And there's plenty of, I've lived down here my whole life. There's plenty of us down here and (laughs) there's just no central kind of hub. And I think Dallas is uniquely poised because of the amount of talent we have here, the infrastructure we have in terms of the clubs and the opportunities. We just need people to know about us. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's the end of the day. People just don't know. We've also got really talented people coming out of this city. So Ralph Barbosa from here still lives here. Uh, A lot of people don't realize that you can now have a career in comedy and not have to move and Mm -hmm. it's because we have the internet like love it or hate it we've got the internet oh yeah no i mean this is i mean and also this is a huge city and one of the reasons i moved here same like i feel like the same thing it's like it's there's infrastructure but it's also like open Mm -hmm. there's opportunities you if you're if you have enough vision you can make your own opportunities Mm -hmm. here and i feel like with the comedy that's especially true yeah that's one of the things i'm always harping on with our students is um you know being an artist isn't just about performing it's about making opportunities for yourself okay yeah and my like just personal goal is to get that more ingrained in the culture so that we have more people who are out there being culture makers Mm -hmm. and and really pushing the scene forward in productive kind of ways and uh, you know, that's that's my dream is that in 25 years, people are moving to Dallas to do comedy and they're moving here because there is a viable path towards a career in comedy where you can be based here. Right. And I I, I genuinely think it's possible. You know, a lot of a lot of things have to happen for us to get there. And it's going to it's going to take time. 
it's not going to happen in five years. Yeah. I mean, it probably needs to be another theater like yours, like in another city in, in the yeah. Metroplex, maybe. Yeah. So our, I mean, our goal would be to be a second city kind of style ah, institution, okay. which I mean, they've been open for 65 years. Sure. <laughs> so, it's, and it's changed a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, so I look at them and I'm like, okay, in 65 years, we'll be there. <laughs> but for, you know, DCC, Dallas Comedy Club has been open for two and a half years. So I look at it. I'm like, well, for two and a half years, we're we're doing pretty good. You got you started up more than they did. Yeah. So, it's so a different world, but. And there's just there's so many resources in Dallas for comedy. I think just if people work in a really smart way, uh, this town can be something special. Yeah. And I use my platform every day to try and coax people in this direction and and you know just help them get those opportunities that they're going to need to help put this place on the map. Excellent. It's it's just there's too much going on here for people yeah, not to know. Yeah, and we focus so much on this show on the music and the comedy is 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 huge and it should be more there should be more attention and, I, and so I'm glad that you could come on and talk about it a little bit. Yeah, happy to. Um, I think some of it is also people who are in the scene don't have the awareness of how wow we really do have something special here because um, there's a lot of focus on just like we're gonna put our heads down and do the work. Yeah, and you got to look at you, you mean tell your people to tell the comedians to look at the musicians and like mm -hmm. there's this self promotion factor yes. that's missing. Yes, because I was thinking about it like when I lived in Austin, like I knew that community of of improvisers because it was like the music community here where they were all out. They'd like support each other. Mm -hmm. They would promote each other themselves. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that was one of the big things with uh, when I met Austin and and doing stuff with him and learning about his band and what they had to do to hustle mm -hmm. and um you know helping them with that a little bit there that is missing a little bit in the comedy community yeah. um there's more of it in stand-up because that's like solo performance and you can promote yourself but right but an improv troupe like it, they could just look at a band and take that promotional model yeah. and fly you know yeah and so i'm i'm trying to push people in that direction as much gotcha. as i can well, you can send them my way i can take some photos i can oh, yeah. help them out with some of that <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll trust me i got plenty of people i could send to all you all right well i'm not looking for work i'm trying to help I'm trying to help your, the, not yours, the comedy the scene. scene. Yeah, because yeah. that's true. It's like, I just, now that we're talking, I'm like, yeah, that's why I don't know. I mean, I know Dante. Yeah. Because I know him personally. I, I don't know any of their comedians because yeah. I don't see them promoting themselves in that way. Yeah, and it's, I think the promotion tends to stay within the comedy scene. Maybe that's it. So it's, it's hard, and I'm not a marketing guru, so I don't have the answer, but you do have to figure out how to market yourself outside of your circle. Yeah. Because, you know, having your friends and people you know or kind of know come to your shows is excellent. And you definitely want to have that because they're the ones who are going to laugh the hardest. Right. But it's limited. Yeah, it's limited. And, and that's kind of what it takes to be successful is you have to figure out how to reach beyond your group. Yep. And it's it's a challenge. I, I remember, um, you know, when I first met the Chansey guys, it was something they were struggling with, too. It's It's not unique to comedy, but it is... I think something that is lacking in the community is yep. the ability to market beyond. And, yeah. you know, I, you know, I work in a place that has a budget, a very small marketing budget, but it is a budget. And so, you know, having a club and a brand kind of helps with that. But when you're an individual, um, figuring out how to brand yourself can be hard. Sure, sure. That was actually, so when I went to SMU, I was in the art school, in your freshman year there, they make you take this class that as a freshman is miserable because it's all about figuring out how to brand yourself as an artist. Hmm. And when you're 18, you're like, I don't even know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but in <laughs> hindsight, having that information kind of from day one of your career is important just to kind of get the wheels turning. And so that's the other thing, just because I am, you know, in kind of the education side of comedy, that's something I want to impart to our students, too, mm -hmm. of, you know, you don't have to know what your voice is, but you need to be aware that you have one so you can start to figure it out and then and then just kind of make your brand as an artist or as a team and and put yourself out there that way. Right. Because, you know, I'm. Claire who likes dogs and bagels but that's not going to get people to come to my shows but if I put myself out there as a comedian who has a strong voice and you know appeals to this demographic then I'm going to get more people to come yes 
So yes. it's I mean dogs and bagels though. It's not dogs, the worst you know, promotion ever. <laughs> it's, it's not the worst actually. <laughs> hey Claire, um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to keep our eye out. We're going to start uh, keying in more to the comedy scene here. So thanks awesome. again. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. I'd like to thank Claire Daigle. You can check out all the shows, classes, and events happening at the Dallas Comedy Club in the links in the show notes. Thank you again to the Deep Ellum Community Center for letting us record there. Theme song, Unstoppable by Celine Narala. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, follow all the good stuff, and share it with your friends. We'll see you next time.